I'm joined by Commissioner Purse of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Hello, Commissioner. Avi, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. I have to start with my disclaimer, which is that my views are my own views and not necessarily those of the SEC or my fellow commissioners. Thank you. Uh, and we encourage the audience to ask questions in the chat on the right-hand side of your video player. So let's just get to the big question first. Uh, is this the year the SEC approves a Bitcoin ETF? Well, that is the big question that everyone has. And my answer is the one that I've had for the last three years, which is I don't know. Uh, and there are a couple reasons for that. One is that we are in a period of transition. Our new chairman is likely to be confirmed um, within the next couple weeks and likely to uh, start shortly thereafter. And so I think that that will make a big difference in this question of, of whether and when an exchange traded product gets approved. But the, the second issue is that we have set a standard that seems to be a bit of a moving target on, um, on, on what we look at when we look at whether an exchange traded product with a Bitcoin underlier can be approved. And um, so it, it's, it's a little hard for us now to backtrack and, and apply a standard that's more similar to what we've applied with other similar underliers like precious metals. Okay, yeah, you obviously have been a lone voice at times arguing in favor of ETF applications. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously the commissioners, uh, some of the other commissioners have had different views. Do you think that, uh, that they're coming around at all? Uh, either, either the other commissioners or the market is coming around enough to perhaps satisfy uh, some of the standards that, um, that the SEC has uh, has used in order to disapprove in the past? Uh, you know, is, is, are any of those hurdles about to get uh, jumped over? Well, look, I can't speak for other commissioners, but what I can say is in the, in the three years that I've been at the commission, the market has matured tremendously. We're seeing a lot of institutional interest in the market. We're seeing sort of quasi exchange traded products in it, it, you know we're seeing ones that are that don't trade in our in our listed markets we're seeing a recently Canada rolled out some new exchange traded products and so those kinds of things uh, are helpful and then i think also you're seeing much more institutional in, in involvement in the underlying market and so the the types of things that might make us comfortable in terms of how that underlying market works um, are things that you're seeing now. So from that perspective, yes. Although, look, the, the Bitcoin market is never going to, to look like a, an equity market, for example. Um, so I think trying to impose that kind of a, a structure on the underlying market is inappropriate. And that is sort of what was hinted at in some of those prior disapprovals. You, you've talked in the past, well, you've talked a bit in the past about how you think uh, other countries may be leaping ahead in terms of innovation and that the U.S. needs to kind of uh, stay ahead of the curve on this. Do you think that's starting to happen? You know, obviously, uh, China has uh, developed a central bank uh, currency. Some other countries have become uh, more friendly jurisdictions for crypto companies. Is that already happening? Uh, is the U.S. a little bit behind the curve in your point of view? I think we're certainly behind the curve. We've seen other countries take a much more, I would say, productive approach to regulating crypto in the sense that it's not saying we shouldn't have any regulations at all. They've just been saying, let's build a regulatory framework that works for crypto. Our approach has been much more of a of a say no and tell people to wait approach. So I think we really need to turn that around, be willing to work to build a framework that is appropriate for this industry. And I'm optimistic that with a new chairman coming in who has deep knowledge of these, of these markets, the crypto markets, that we, that is something that we could do together is build a good regulatory framework. Um, but other countries have been moving ahead. I, I think with respect specifically to the CBDC, the, the central bank digital currency, um, a country like China that has, has um, surveillance that sort of is part of the package along with the, the central bank digital currency, I'm not sure how much of a competitor that would be for either private market digital currencies or a digital currency that, that the United States could develop, um, that the Fed could develop in the US. 
Do, do you think it's time for the Fed to do that? Well, that's outside my bailiwick. I certainly can't speak for the Fed. Um, but what I will say is that there are private market alternatives that I think are functioning much as a CBDC would function. And I think there's there's some real um, possibility around those private market alternatives. They're already you know operating and there there's a lot of volume in those in those um, currencies now. And so, it seems that you know the Fed. I think well, it, it's something the Fed is going to look at. But I think even if it were to go down that path, it would take some time. So I think we should really look at what's happening in the private markets. Okay, are you referring to stable coins there for the most part? I am. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, you know, for years, uh, investors have kind of warned, or, or uh, investment managers have warned that the government could always ban this uh, Bitcoin in particular. Uh, are we past that point? Uh, you know, is, is, are there so many nodes running around the world that the notion that the government could ban Bitcoin is, is no longer a possibility? I think we were past that point very early on because you'd have to shut down the internet, as I've said in the past. I don't, I don't see how you could ban it. You, could, you can certainly make the effort. A government could say it's not allowed here, but, but people would still be able to do it. Um, and it would be very hard to stop people from doing it. So I think that it would be it would be a foolish thing for the government to try to do that. Um, and, and I think we'd be missing out, you know, a bigger a bigger problem is that we'd be missing out on the innovation around around Bitcoin and other digital assets if we decided to try to stop them. Uh, in a speech last month, you, you talked about um, Bitcoin being uh, a, a, a medium that could be used by, say, the freedom fighters uh, of today or. You know, and you even referenced uh, Harriet Tubman as you know a freedom fighter of the past who who had trouble getting financing for her heroic work. Uh, who who is it now who are the sort of freedom fighters of the moment that are using Bitcoin or or might be able to use it in the near future? Well, there certainly aren't too many uh, too many Har Harriet Tubmans in the world. She was an amazing woman. Who um, the more I read about her, the more more impressed I was. But I think there are people in today's world who are um, living in conditions where it's very difficult to to carry around a lot of a lot of um, currency, for example, or they're in situations like a woman living in a rural community where she's very dependent upon others um, to to support her and therefore she she could become a victim of, of violence or something like that if she has access to a computer where she can actually do work and get compensated for it in cryptocurrency and then take that cryptocurrency with her if she's trying to escape a bad situation those are the kinds of things i think of or refugees living in refugee camps you, you see um, you know the the really difficult situations they're in. They could, if they have if they have internet access, they could actually be earning money in cryptocurrency and carry that with them in a way that um, they could they could actually travel as they might need to do. So there are real opportunities, and I think we need to we need to remember that when sometimes we're thinking of the the negative connotations that go along with cryptocurrency, but we should also think about this other side of things, that it can really liberate people and enable people to get out of really difficult situations. Yeah, with that in mind, I, I did want to ask about the negative connotations as well. Um, you know, it, it, in particular, obviously, there, there were reports that said that uh, some of the people involved in the Capitol riots had received Bitcoin in advance of it. You know, the Mueller report did discuss uh, how Bitcoin uh, was used um, by Russian hackers uh, to, uh, to to you know finance some of the hacking operations. Uh, what is the government's role in stopping that sort of thing? You know, is, is there a concern that uh, Bitcoin is is too hard to stop for those kinds of uh, events? Well, the government certainly has a role in trying to stop. Um, all of those kinds of events. And I think whether you're getting paid in Bitcoin or, or getting funded with cash um, or with some other currency, the, the goal is to try to stop that kind of behavior. I, I actually think that with Bitcoin, there's a trail there that does make tracking that uh, payment flow perhaps easier than it would be, certainly easier than it would be with, with physical cash. Uh, and so there are firms that exist that can track back 
Um, but, you know, I think the bottom line is that people are people, and so they're going to do good things and bad things with a tool that you build. Um, and so don't blame the tool, but try to go after the, the, the people with uh, bad, who are doing the bad things. Okay. As far as um, Bitcoin market structure, too, uh, there's some criticism about Bitcoin, just like there's some criticism about the U.S. economy, that there's a lot of power in the hands of a very few, uh, beyond just Satoshi, uh, that, that, you know, there are uh, perhaps a few hundred people who own the vast majority of uh, the Bitcoins in the world. And if this is to be used for the good of the people, you know, the, the notion being is there too much uh, market power in the hands of a few and is there a way to deal with that uh, at the government level well it's a new technology and uh, relatively new now it's a decade old and and so the people who got in very early certainly have done well so far uh, but it's a technology that is inherently very democratic and um, anyone can participate uh, anyone can receive and send Bitcoin who has, again, who has access to, to a, a computer um, or a mobile phone for that matter. So everyone can participate. And I think um, as, as we see more interest uh, across the world, you're going to see a, a broader diversity of, of people participating. I frankly think that the legacy financial system is, is, is much more concentrated and, and tends to concentration much more than than a decentralized crypto um, financial system you know the uh, regulatory bodies in the United States have taken often a slightly different role um, in in regulating Bitcoin so the IRS uh, you know may call it an asset the CFTC may say it's a commodity the SEC of course is going to review any uh, Bitcoin ETF is there some is there some necessity for some larger body to come in and kind of tie all of these together? Because some of the crypto entrepreneurs will say, you know, I hear one thing from my friends on this, uh, you know, on this part of the hall and something else from the other side of the hall. Is there some uh, regulatory shift that has to happen to make this uh, more understandable for operations? Well, I think it is a complicated regulatory structure that, that anyone in this industry runs into. It's not only at the federal level, but at the state level, you've got lots of interest. And that's a bit of a function of the fact that that's just how our financial regulatory structure is designed. But I think there is a role for Congress um, to come in and, and maybe draw some clearer lines or at least urge us as regulators to get together and, and kind of figure out what falls where. Um, I think there's also room for potentially setting up a cross-agency sandbox type thing where people could come in and experiment with different things if they weren't sure exactly which box, which regulatory box something fit in. Um, so those are a couple of th things I would do. I think we as regulators can work together anyway. I mean, we have a very close relationship with our fellow capital markets regulator, the CFTC, um, and I think there's room for us to get together and, and have conversations specifically about crypto. And, and I'm hoping, since we're getting a chairman who used to be the chairman of the CFTC, I'm, I'm expecting that relationship to be a really strong one and, and for him to have a, a good sense of kind of how the regulatory, the regulatory boundaries should be drawn. Uh, great. Yeah, we'll, we'll hear from him soon, hopefully. Um, the, we did get a, an audience question, and we, we definitely have time for a few more. So please do uh, put your questions uh, in, in the chat box for, uh, for the commissioner. Um, what, one question we got is that uh, it is about the role of uh, electricity um, you know, in, in crypto, uh, that you know, uh, electricity is kind of a, 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 a fundamental key driver for crypto. Obviously, it's been, um, it, it's, there's been one criticism that it's uh, you know, environmentally inefficient, that uh, um, while, you know, and, and this commenter said, you know, gold is sort of, it's, uh, it, it, it doesn't need all of that. Though, of course, you have to mine it, so it's not exactly a, uh, a, a victimless um, uh, operation as well. But how would you uh, deal with, I guess, that issue of um, the amount of electricity that's needed for, uh, for crypto? Is that something that is a limiting factor? And is that something that the government should be involved in? 
Well, it's not really an issue for the SEC, but I will say that that you know everything that we do as people consumes energy, and you make determinations about about how to what what's worth consuming energy on. And I think if you look at the financial system as a whole, it too consumes a lot of electricity. And so it isn't surprising that that Bitcoin consumes uh, consumes electricity. But I think some of the comparisons between, you know, well, one, you know, gold doesn't consume as much as as Bitcoin or cash doesn't. But those 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 comparisons sometimes don't they're not matched quite right. So I think that's one thing I would say, make sure that you're comparing Bitcoin with the right other thing. And the other thing I would say is that Bitcoin mining operations can be moved fairly easily and they can move in response to where there's excess electricity. So they can move to places that, that you know, have cheap electricity at the time or electricity that's going to otherwise be wasted um, you know that's that's being generated, but otherwise is going to be wasted. Could go to could go to mining. Um, but again, I think this is just a bigger question about making decisions about what we think is worth something and what we think is not, um, and something that people may disagree on. Uh, one question I've had too is that you know right now we're seeing the development, of course, of government cryptocurrencies. We have uh, decentralized cri cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, and then you have sort of corporate backed. Uh, cryptocurrencies uh, like Libra, um, and uh, um, you know, and obviously other companies are considering different cryptocurrencies. Uh, is there room for all three of these? Do you think one will become dominant, uh, and and do all of them need regulation in different ways? Well, I think there's real power in it in crypto that is decentralized, that's not controlled by one central party. That's one of the things that that. Um, crypto advocates, I think, a point that they make that's a valid point, right? Some, some of the weaknesses in our financial system come from its centralization, and you can actually make a more robust um, and more, resili more resilient financial system if you have multiple actors, if you have a decentralized system. And then you're not reliant on any one central party, and, and you've got this community of people who build a network. And so I think that's valuable. I mean, certainly that that does raise questions about how to regulate it because our regulatory system is much more comfortable with centralized things where it's one company that's, that's building something or doing something. Um, and so I think that, that, that it, it does raise challenges for us as, as regulators, but I don't think it will stop us from um, setting up an appropriate regulatory framework. And certainly there are other, you know, the, the, I don't want to speak to any particular entity, but I think um, there are others that are trying to bring together a consortium of companies to build something. Um, and, and so we'll kind of see what wins out in, in the marketplace. That's where I always like to do the testing is the marketplace, see what people want to use. Do they want to use a central bank digital currency or do they like private stable coins better? That's, that's not up to me.